So this is class two, talking about the uh, sequence of operations. Sequence of operations is very important because we need to have the right sequence when we turn on a big boiler. And we had six steps last time, and if Felipe was here, he would have told us because he was writing it down. What is the first one? Merge. Merge. Like the pilot. So we talked about this, and uh, we want to use steam. This is the main purpose of us having an industrial boiler. It's not usually for hot water, it's mainly for steam, unless you have a huge hot water boiler, like uh, Thermofry. Thermofry, they do not uh, produce steam, they produce hot water in high capacity. So for example, instead of having a big boiler that will generate steam, you have a small boiler that has very high velocity. It has so much heat that the water will run through it and jump from 50 degrees to 180 or 190. We have about uh, two or three thermopride high velocity boilers that produce hot water and they are around 1.5 million BTUs. And so the water will rush through it and get hot, heated quickly. Huh? They're very heavy. We have one in the back probably you've, you've seen. It. They're very heavy, but they're very small, and they are, their main pro, uh, purpose is to uh, produce hot water. For us, uh, for other boilers, we use uh, steam load. We're producing steam. Uh, many buildings use steam to produce uh, power, electricity, and use the uh, excess steam to cogenerate, which means heat the building. So we will produce power, make steam, produce power, and use the excess to heat the building. So steam is the main purpose we want to generate, and this is our output. So we measure our output and by temperature, by, by steam, amount of steam, and it's uh, power and pressure. So steam load is usually measured in pressure. If we, so there is this. It's not quantity, it's not uh, volume, it's pressure. And that pressure leads to more power. So we, it can go up to 5,000 megapascal. Like a lot. Use train, that's what they yeah, do. you train push a train with a steam, yeah. you push a turbine, so it's usually a lot of power in the steam. More steam, more, uh, more pressure, also more power. The system monitors the production of steam using pressure gauges. Who did the paper on pressure gauges? I think Michael. So pressure gauges will monitor the presence and amount of steam in that point. So we have many checkpoints in the plant to know how much steam do we have. And we have an upper limit and lower limit. And it's very sensitive because if you increase the pressure at some point, you might burst the pipe. Uh, on and off control, so fire is, if the fire is on, you have steam, and if you have noticed when we work with our residential steam boilers, that it takes time to heat the water from 60 to 200, but after that, the steam generation is very quick, very quick and very fast, that's why we need a lot of fast reacting components. So uh, on and off, so we turn the fire on, we have steam, fire off, no steam. 
more steam and less steam. So it's on and off situation. And uh, we adjust the differential that regulate the operating weight for the boiler. The more fire you put, fire will eventually become related directly to the steam. Uh, so we have a cut in pressure and cut out pressure. And sometimes we have steady flow. So it looks something like this. This is my set point, my set point. And uh, <coughs> if you remember alternating current, it's something similar to that, where you have a, the pressure pulls off and you have a cut in where you turn on the fire, fire comes up, goes up, then you start to cut it off and it fluctuates back and forth based on the amount of steam that you have in the uh, plant requirement. So this is on and off pressure and eventually this will average out and becomes a line. So the smaller the period you have, the better. So eventually you can have minimum fuel running with the right amount of flame to produce steam steady at a steady state. But there's none on and off. If you don't have a regulating mean to regulate the amount of flame coming into the, the chamber, you will have on and off situation where you have low and high which is not very ideal because between the lows and highs you have a lot of losses. So you want to have the amount of fire that will produce the steam that you require for that plant. So modulation. We talked about modulation before because again, as we saw, it's a wave, it goes up and down. So you modulate to get the frequency that you want. By frequency we mean a cycle between on and off. That's a cycle and the frequency is the cycles per second. So the pressure control device that provides local control to the firing weight proportional to the steam pressure. So the steam is the output and the input is fire. So and what do we control when we trying to make fire inside a chamber? The air. The air, that's residential. And that's to control the smoke. You control the uh, firing weight, you control the fuel. Think of the car again. The more gas you put, the more engine power you get. So we modulate the fuel, and the fuel has its own regulating door for the damper. So the more fuel, there's, some, uh, there's gonna be some kind of lever, some kind of relationship where you input more air to uh, drive the fuel. So <coughs> this is one of the pressure control that we have in the system, and you set up the cut in, and they cut out, and if you can see, there's like two on and off switches here. So you set your cut in to whatever low pressure you want, 50 PSI, and the cut out are 250 PSI. And this will be at the output of the boiler. And you can see it in the boiler we have here, the HP Smith, the big ones, they have modulating steam. So they turn it on and off based on the steam production to have steady steam production. And again, the more accurate and more fast the boiler <laughs> runs, uh, the more you, the less uh, on and off you, will, you need. Uh, so there's something called single point positioning. You don't need to remember all the details of this uh, terminology unless you work in a power plant. But what do they mean by single point positioning? It's a modulating system where the steam is the input signal and the output signal to modulate the motor that turns a, cra a jack shaft to modulate the air and fuel Flow. So what does that mean? One signal only, but the car accelerator. So what is your engine signal to accelerate? The gas. Huh? The gas. You have only single point. You only hit the gas, and the engine will increase the fuel, and also in increase the air. So imagine if you had to increase both at the same time. You have to do the, the fuel and the air at the same time. That'll be two points. So this is something called single point positioning, which you only control the fuel coming in, and there is an automated uh, system that will increase the air based on that fuel. Any question? Make sense a little bit? Yeah. Yeah, just follow the small logical things. Don't get too much caught up in, into the detail. Parallel positioning is when you control two signals. So you modulate using steam pressure as the input, and the output will be the fuel valve that modulate the fuel flow, another signal to, buy, to a variable speed motor motor, and the effort to increase the air. So you have something that my output is going to be the same. If again, compare that to a car cruise control, you set the cruise on 
60 miles per hour, and if you see that, the pedal actually changes. Yeah, you'll change the fuel, and the fuel will change the air. So we have parallel positioning and single positioning. Single means you only control the fuel, and double uh, parallel, you control the fuel and the air at the same time. So the control sends two different signals to two different separate entities. Which one is better? Parallel uh, positioning is more consistent combustion. This is some of the advantages. If you have parallel, if you have the pressure as an output, and you can control both the fuel and the air at the same time, that will be more consistent with the burning of the fuel. Uh, meanwhile, if you have uh, a damper that is connected to the fuel line, uh, the adjustment of the amount of air or opening of the damper will change, but it will not take into consideration the quality of the air. Is the air cold? Is it high in oxygen? Is it low in oxygen? So it's not going to be as accurate. So parallel position is more consistent and it's easier to adjust. That's uh, from a power plant point of view. Uh, less mechanical involved as well. Uh, because when we have single positioning, you'll have the fuel as an input. Something has to measure the fuel amount and based on that to control uh, a modulating motor to open and close the damper. So it's less mechanically involved. The metering system. So we need to take measurements. Why do we need to take measurement? We want to make sure that we have complete combustion, that we're burning the fuel completely, there is no excess air, and there is no excess uh, fuel. What would happen if we have any excess air or excess fuel? Matt? Soot. Huh? Soot. Soot? Hamilton? Smoke. Smoke. So we need to also do flow rate measurement, Q. What am I doing for flow rate? I'm trying to measure the amount of fuel I'm delivering to the chamber. So with that, you might need to use some uh, an instrument that will measure how much air is coming in, in cubic feet per minute, in gallons, and so forth. So oxygen sensors are very important. They came into play, I think, around the 90s, and it has improved the combustion efficient, uh, significantly. Uh, probably you've seen all the old cars, not, they don't have any oxygen sensor, and the combustion usually is not that accurate. Newer car have more uh, cleaner combustion and less smoke for many reasons. One of them is the oxygen sensor. And uh, again, many times, it's probably your car, the check engine light comes in and it tells you it's an oxygen sensor fault. Does it mean the oxygen sensor is wrong? No. Sometimes your air filter could be clogged. And the <coughs> oxygen sensor is not getting enough oxygen so it will send you a signal saying that something is wrong with the, with the air intake. Is an another oxygen sensor in the outside the engine at the catalyst, yeah, at the catalyst converter, because they want to compare how much are we burning. So we have two oxygen sensors. Uh, is anybody doing oxygen sensor for the paper? I don't remember seeing that. So oxygen sensor usually is a uh, is made out of quartz and uh, zirconium, and it's a material that reacts once activated. It will react to the oxygen and will tell you how much oxygen is in the air. Slide. Uh, so oxygen sensor will measure the amount of oxygen in the air coming in and the amount of oxygen in the air in the exhaust. And we have something called variable speed drive, which is a different inducer fan with different speed. So based on the amount of oxygen, you can increase or decrease the amount of air coming into the chamber. And uh, car oxidation, trying to like give an analogy, how does the car monitor the amount of oxygen coming in and the amount of oxygen going out, and that's when you have a bad uh, combustion in your engine. Uh, these days, even if the car is having bad combustion, you do not see smoke. Even if the car is burning oil, there is no smoke. Uh, I think in the 80s, they started putting, uh, made it a law to have uh, a catalytic converter in the car, and that is because, of course, for the environment, but the uh, catalytic converter is a chamber outside your engine that overheats. It gets to a temperature really high, around 800 degrees. So it burns any excess fuel that was not burned into the engine. Uh, however, when you go do your emission test, which is mandatory here, they measure your combustion. And they want to see how much actually you burned out of the fuel. And then if something is wrong, you will have to go and 
uh, just uh, uh, something in the engine. Usually, either the fuel injection, the plug, sometimes you do your, your filter or air filter is wrong, and sometimes uh, the inducer fan that sucks in, uh, uh, air into the engine is not functioning. The properly. regulations tell you the difference. It's 15, car, 15 years or older, you don't need to get emissions. Yeah, so because the car is not capable of doing that. Yeah, yeah. And when you bought the car, so what are you going to do? I'm going to yeah. sell the car now? Yeah. So, so system communication. Uh, we talked about PLC. What is PLC? PLC. You hear that a lot. Programmable logic control. Programmable logic control. It is binary, which means what? Numbers. Numbers. Ones. It's two things. Either zero or one. Either on or off. So binary and digital. So that kind of signal will be sent from a lot of sensors that you guys are doing research on to the controller. And uh, some controller have more signals that they process to increase the air or decrease the fuel. Uh, so low and high limits now are done like digitally. If you look at the, at the Aquastat for, res for residential, it has digital sensors uh, to control the on and off function of the primary control. There are also pneumatic signals. You've seen this in the lab. So you can send the signal either through binary, digital stuff, or through pneumatic. What does pneumatic mean? If something is pneumatic. Tim, you know that. Uses air. So pneumatic uses air, compressed air. And uh, this was the beginning of all plants. When we go to all plants, you'll see pneumatic systems still there. You see a lot of hoses with compressed air in it. So when you have extra pressure, it will open a valve. Or if you have vacuum, it will close a valve. So air was a, a mean to control signals. Uh, it, it still exists. And again, we go back to the automatic transmission. When it first came out in the 60s, it was all pneumatic using vacuum from the engine to switch gears based on sensors and pressure. So. This is some of the terminology that we, I want you to remember. Again, there's a lot involved, and probably do a lot of that in uh, power plant. But for now, this is, I'm trying to do some of the terminology into our control. Next thing, we'll talk about something that has to do with the code, which is the gas and gas trains. So this is mainly about codes. So what do we mean by gas train? It's not a train, it's not a choo-choo train. Sorry. It's actually a train of valves. How many valves do you need? And you'll be surprised at how many valves are involved into just the pilot or just the main fuel. The more valves we have, the more we can regulate the pressure of gas or oil coming into the into the the boiler. And they go. Uh, the one most category that we use for regulating the gas train is the BTU. The bigger the boiler, the more redundancy you need. You'll see at least sometimes two check valves or two relief valves to uh, regulate the pressure. Uh, we'll do that next week. Right. Thank you, Pierre. He's not here. My producer.